Welcome to the Neuro and Cognitive Science of Presence Roundtable. Please welcome your speakers, Kimberly Vole, Mayank Mehta, and Oliver Kralos, and your moderator, Walter Greenleaf. Wow. I'm really impressed by both the depth of the presentations, uh, the science behind it, and the fact that we have an attentive audience for something that really is an emerging field and a deep field. So thank you guys. I'm really looking forward to your questions. We'll save some time for that. But we're also going to have a little bit of a debate and a discussion here too about uh, the neuroscience of presence and the cognitive issues behind it. Um, I'll, I'm going to start out very briefly, uh, and I can't resist the chance to give a little bit of my spiel just because it will be a bit of a frame for what we're doing here. I'm excited to be here for three reasons. Number one, I've been in the field of um, virtual reality now for almost 30 years, and you cannot imagine how exciting it is to see the field just finally take off and to really, really get going. Uh, I'm, I'm just so excited about that. Um, and, but there's more to come. Uh, I'm also excited to be here because I almost wasn't here. I was in the ICU at uh, a nearby hospital up until about five hours ago um, for uh, something that involves my brain and was very uncomfortable. But the reason I'm still here now instead of staying there was I'm very excited about these topics and these presentations. So <laughs> thank you guys for getting me out of bed. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, also the other reason is I want to learn from the, from the audience. I mean, this is fantastic that we have a group of attentive people who are into the neuroscience behind VR. So the fun is just starting. Well, to be very quickly here, my, my position right now is I think medicine is going to be the deepest vertical in, vir in virtual reality. I think entertainment and uh, communication and gaming, it's all going to be really exciting. It's going to drive things drive the process down, but I think medicine is going to be the deepest vertical, and there's reasons for that that I don't have time to go into now. Medicine it needs a telemedicine platform. Medicine needs behavioral interventions to help us change our behavior to live healthier lives, but there's plenty of reasons and evidence to see it. And the good news is there's a lot of data that's been collected over the last 30 years in research labs uh, that support this. So we're not just starting new. We have algorithms, we have principles, we have heuristics, all based on the work of, of many hardworking people who've been slaving away using very expensive computers and very heavy headsets to get us to where we are now. Um, there are several areas where VR is going to make a big difference. Uh, uh, training, assessments, interventions, health and wellness. Um, the list is huge. I, I don't have time to go into it now. Uh, perhaps later, if you grab me, I can. But uh, we already have maybe 30 or 40 different interventions and assessments that have been demonstrated through research to be useful using VR. And probably most importantly is the fact that some of these interventions that VR enables us to do are on some otherwise very difficult problems to solve, such as addictions, such as autism and Asperger's, such as cognitive aging. So I'm very excited about what VR will do for our future. And one thing I want to prime the uh, panel to talk about is we haven't really talked about mirror neurons yet and how they play a role in social VR and, and in cognition. So that's going to be one of my questions that we get to here. Okay, well, so with that, without further ado, let's open it up to uh, a debate among here. I'm going to pose a question to our panel. Do you think that presence is plastic? And what I mean by that is the sense that when we grew up watching television, go into movies, we learned to cognitively use the tropes, the heuristics, the storytelling mechanisms that were part of that medium. And our brain adapted to that. Our brain learned to put ourselves cognitively into the movie world or the television world. Do you think that with VR, there will be a change in how we perceive things that will be a learned response that the first time we're in VR is going to be very different than the hundredth time we're in VR. And the work of the developers out there are going to develop ways of interacting that we're going to have to adapt to. Uh, wh what's your perspective on that? Are we going to go in order? <laughs> sure. Uh, that, I think that's a really great question. I mean, I think that we can look back at some of the technological advancements in the last, you know, 
what, 10 years or so around mobile, for example, where you see the, the language of you know, pinching to, to zoom in and out, et cetera, become something that is a natural part of, of our unconscious vocabulary for those that have spent a lot of time around the technology. And I think that kind of language is going to emerge within the context of VR as well. We just really, it's such early days, I think, in terms of being able to get affordable mass market VR that we just haven't had really enough humans exposed to it to have a very good sense of that. But I think all of that affects, you know, and I was talking about that perceptual soup, the cognitive load of what it is that you're paying attention to, the mental model that you're generating. I mean, all of these things affect that signal to noise ratio. And so I think it's inevitable that it will shift and probably shift quite dramatically as we go. Wonderful. I probably won't be able to very much contribute to that question because as it turns out, we have been doing VR uh, at K Caves for a very long time, but we have always been doing it from a point of view, what can we do in VR? It was never about creating presence. That was mostly coincidental. It was always about to get stuff done. And so what we have noticed is that maybe it's related to this, that the, effect, the effectiveness at which we can get stuff done mm -hmm. in a virtual world when we are analyzing uh, three-dimensional data, surrounding us with three-dimensional data, has not really changed based on the exposure of someone being in there. Uh, what has changed is that as people get more trained in the tools that we are using to analyze those data or to work with those environments, uh, they become better because they learn the tools. Um, but I don't think that the, that the fundamental difference that we are seeing between using similar tools in a 2D desktop environment versus seeing them in a VR environment, that that is so much more effective, I do not think that that fundamental difference is really changing over time. So I do not know how that speaks to the plasticity of presence, um, but I think I can only talk about the plasticity or the non-plasticity in this case that we have observed of the effectiveness of using VR as a tool to get something done. So maybe it is related, maybe it is not. I really cannot... Uh, cannot make a, uh, a judgment on that one. It, it is a dynamic process, and as you evolve your tools, it's hard to say who's adapting, the technology or you. Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. So there is actually uh, what we will adapt to and how we'll respond actually depends on what it is that's out there. So for example, there is this famous example of so-called the rubber glove experiment. So I can sit you in front of a mirror, which is a partition, and I can stroke your hand while in the mirror you're just seeing the glove being stroked. Even though your hand is not being stroked, you're seeing the image. And after five minutes of stroking just the fake glove where your hand should be, if I hit the glove, you're going to feel pain. Whereas no matter what you do, if there's a vertical line and another line is slightly off, it is going to be off. So there are certain aspects of the brain that through evolution, the brain knows that these things can change. My hand can be open, my hand can be closed, my hand can be here, it can be there. Those contingencies can change. But the laws of physics say that if this is vertical, this is horizontal, that's the way it is. You better not screw with it. So when we start experiencing VR, there'll be some things that will run into conflict as you mentioned as well, which are at the end decided by the brain's laws of biophysics. Those laws of biophysics and evolution have turned some things that we can change readily. In fact, we are willing to buy it all the time, even though it's not true. So other things we cannot change. Do you, and the key do thing is how to thread that thing right. in a good way. Do you think we know enough about what those things are that we could give guidance to developers saying? Definitely. Okay. We definitely know a fair bit already that some things that are being done are actually not a great idea. Mm. But there's some other things we should be doing which will improve things. Do you think that extends to the social brain? Um, are there aspects of human social interaction which are firm lines like you described, or is that a very mutable thing? I'll take it last. We'll go in this <laughs> order. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, immediately what springs to mind is, is, of course, the uncanny valley. And, you know, when we try to, when we basically push it too far and we try to overcommit to things that really we can't represent artificially that well yet. And so I think all of that contributes to the social side of things. So if you have somebody in a space, you know, I was talking earlier about this notion of co-presence, like what does it mean to share 
that space. I mean, there's all sorts of different facets to that. It can be that we can have a conversation, but I mean, we can do that over a phone and we don't necessarily have a shared space sense. Uh, and so you can go all the way to having an avatar or within VR, for example, and do we actually feel like we are within that space? And well, yeah, I mean, there's a volume, there's extension into that space and there's all of these different things. But some of the stuff that really sells that is kind of the things that I was talking about earlier where you we're able to respond to each other in a natural way. So if if you're just seeing a projection of me and you're not necessarily seeing kind of some of my movements, so if I point, et cetera, and you're not following that point, you feel less like you're there with me as a result. And for anyone that's been in a teleconference call, I mean, that sucks, right? I mean, you never really feel like you're there because some of that cadence of movement isn't present. So capturing some of those natural saccades and figuring out the, you know, what to your point, what are the things that we have to represent? And it turns out, you know, the saccade and movements of the head matters, hand gesticulation matters, body presence, meh, that's not quite as important. So recognizing what are those things that I think we're really just only starting to unlock that communicate social presence, a shared presence in a space. Uh, it's just really starting to happen now and perhaps has been even more unlocked with the, the rapid approach of affordable VR. I feel like I'm on the wrong panel. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to contribute. So, uh, uh, you, you could ask a question. Yeah, I will <laughs> later. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that we have also been working with for a long time is the ability of having people work together uh, in the same virtual space, even though they're in different physical spaces. Because uh, science is a is a collaborative discipline, and many collaborations are over long distance. If you can bring people together in VR, that really improves the quality. Uh, of the collaboration, because I think we can all agree that video conferencing sucks. Uh, <laughs> don't tell Cisco I said that. Um, so what we have been developing is the infrastructure to bring people into the space, and of course the question that came up initially was how do you represent a person in the space? And so we have seen a lot of examples in your talk uh, uh, and all throughout the day how that is done with animated avatars. Um, and so as it turns out, when we, had developed, when we developed, uh, this is toolkit of collaboration, the initial thing that we had was just literally a head model and a floating hand model represented by the tracked input devices. And we never really thought about that very much because it was always meant as a stand-in for better things to come in the future. Maybe we'll have animated avatars at some point. Uh, but at some point, I remember we were doing an experiment uh, with uh, one of my colleagues from the geoscience side, Dawn Sumner. She was in the cave, and I was in another environment across the street, and we were just working together, and we were looking at some of the data. And at some point in the middle of it, I was also showing it to other people. I handed off the glasses. We were not using head mounts. I was handing off the glasses and the control to someone else who then took over, but forgot to mention that to the other side. Uh, and not only did the person on the other side, Dawn, notice that it wasn't me anymore, uh, but she noticed actually who it was. She recognized the person just by their very low-level body language of moving the head and moving the hand. That was fascinating, that you can recognize someone by these very simplified avatars. Um, and, and also that could, could create dissonance, too, that if, as, as Kimberly pointed out, if you don't have it right, it's going to exactly. seem really strange. Which is why uh, why we have done some experiments with animation, but if you don't have enough data for, for really faithful animation, then anything you do get wrong, if the elbow sticks out like that a little bit, like you get in connect tracking, it just breaks the illusion in a horrifying way. Uh, and then when we went a little bit beyond that, we started looking into not uh, animated avatars, but 3D video avatars captured by live 3D cameras. I've done some work with the Kinect back in the day, and that's the main reason why I've been doing that. Uh, where you bring in a pseudo-holographic representation of the person, including the clothes they're wearing and the folds in their shirts and all that. And it turns out that that was a, a major improvement even over what we had seen before. That these things were low res and they were fuzzy, but they just seemed incredibly realistic. Realistic to the point that if you see your own body represented like that, you definitely felt it was your body. You could look down yeah. at your feet and every little motion you made was represented, but then even more when it was somebody else. Well, and, and I've seen plenty of examples where if you allow someone to customize their avatar themselves, it doesn't have to look like themselves, but if they have the act of creating it, it creates more of a feeling of presence for them with their avatar. I believe that. We haven't tried that, but yes, because you have that ownership of it then when you customize. In our case, again, we went for the very naturalistic approach where you bring you into the system exactly as you are, um, but we, we made these, and, and you talked about that in your presentation, actually, we made these, uh, it wasn't really intentional experiments, we just demonstrated the system to people, but we showed previously, we called it people, uh, and we found out that we had two programs that we were showing sometimes. One of them was showing an animated 
character from a video game, basically. I did some hacking and I ripped some animation data out of Doom 3 at the time. Uh, and the other one were these very low-res, fuzzy uh, video avatars. And when we showed the, the game avatar, people were just treating it like an object. They were like putting the hands in there and sticking the heads inside and walking around and getting really close and not really having the social conscience. But the moment we brought in these really poor looking captured avatars, then suddenly people without noticing it just took a step back and they didn't stare, it was rude. And they didn't stick the hand out. And that was, we got this really interesting observation that you never studied scientifically, you just observed that as an as a anecdote, so to speak. But it was really interesting that we saw these very different levels, that even with an extremely low level avatar, you can tell people, but then with these very realistic ones, you suddenly get a lot of social clues, and social cues, sorry, um, that you would not get in many other ways, including uh, video conference. You, know, you just don't get the feeling you're talking to an actual person. You know, I agree with everything you said, except the first thing. I think you are on the right panel. <laughs> well, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you definitely are. So, sure. So I think another thing that aspect is worth considering in anything that is social interaction is what is a social interaction. Let's even leave virtual reality aside. So let's say I'm sitting here and I'm, I don't know, talking to somebody on the phone versus that person is present in front of me. What is that different? Or as you mentioned, video conference. Why do video conferences suck? What is that big difference? We can have enough resolution, screen size, size of the human, volume. Those are not the real issues. So it turns out that there are certain specific parts of the brain which are involved in social cognition. And like everything else, such as laws of physics determine your leg can't bend this way or the other way, there are laws of the biophysics that determine how that part of the brain is going to operate. One of that part of the brain that is involved in generating social presence or sensing the presence of another person of your species is the same part of the circuit I was talking about, which makes maps of space and episodic memories. And it turns out that there are very specific kinds of chemicals that are released in that brain, and I won't bore you to death with those names of those things. Those chemicals determine to some extent, this is still at a very early stage. The research in this is at a very early stage. Those chemicals determine how much of a sense of presence you are going to generate. So generating the sense of presence in VR, of presence of another human being, of your species, there are many, many levels of assumptions that are going in there. And I think we are at an early stage where it's going to be possible but we'll have to first take the lead from understanding what is it to say I'm in presence of another human being versus just an image. When we look at the work that's been done using um, um, exposure therapy for post-traumatic stress, there's been some interesting work looking at cognitive enhancers, um, decycloserine, for example, to uh, a drug. To uh, Exactly right, yeah. yeah. And PTSD, there are lots of clinical trials going on where one can use VR and how the brain circuits get modified under PTSD to use VR to treat PTSD. To treat it yeah, very successfully, too. Going on in the uh, and for a moment there, I thought you uh, Go ahead. I need to say something to this. Because Please. Uh, Mayang made a very, very good point, uh, and that is we have now been ragging on video conferencing, and I want to put it on a more scientific and theoretical basis. <laughs> um, Please. If you, if you go back to my talk, uh, I was talking about all the things that you have to do right in order to create the impression that you're looking at an object as opposed to an image of an object. Uh, there's a really fundamental difference, you have to think about that, between an image and the object that is shown in the image. A human being would never confuse those. Uh, you would never walk up to a movie post and try to talk to the person in the poster or try to shake their hand, it just doesn't work that way. Because uh, the poster or the 2D video is violating all of those things that are said you must not violate in VR. And our brains are extremely good at picking up on that. So I had an interesting conversation with, I'm not going to name names, with someone who was selling a very high resolution video conference system and they were doing a live demonstration where they had someone at the other end and it was really high res, big screen, um, and, uh, uh, and, and sorry, very low latency. And so he was talking about how great this was and then I challenged him and said, well, can you shake the hand of the other person on the other side? And he's like, what are you talking about? It makes no sense. Why would I, how can I shake the hand? I'm like, well, Sam, that's the problem because you can't. Whereas with a VR system, uh, specifically with an animated system or even with the 3D video especially, when I tell someone, hey, shake that person's hand, they go and they shake that person's hand because it is now the brain recognizes it and as a person. And I, think, and I think because of our legacy of it 
migrating a lot of content from video games, we don't have crying, we don't have hugging. We, there's a lot of human behaviors that haven't quite made it over to the common commonality of our VR world yet because of that legacy. There, there's a lot of stabbing and things like that. Uh, I, for and a moment there, I thought you were going to talk about mirror neurons, uh, too. That's right. That's the first part that I briefly mentioned, that those neurons which are involved in perceiving that the hand that was being touched, even though it's not my hand, the laws of physics say that it could be my hand. That's the thing that is being done by, supposedly, by mirror neurons. We don't really know, but that's the case. But that's actually just a small part of the brain that's involved in this. Like, for example, there is a parietal cortex right at the top. Uh, which sends information to hippocampus. And patients who have damage to parietal cortex, they develop this funny thing called hemineglect. So they could be sitting in space, and you can tell them, do you see a hand? They'll say yes. You say, do you see a hand? They'll say yes. And then you can say, all right, here is a tray full of food. Eat it. They'll eat it, but they'll eat the food only from the right half. You say, why didn't you eat the food on the left half? Didn't you see it? He said, yeah, I saw it. I just didn't feel like it. So OK, maybe they didn't feel like it. It's all about space. You go with a tray of champagne glasses full. They have to hold the tray in the middle. Do you see the tray? You say, yes. You take the tray to them. They hold it not in the middle, to the corner, the other half. Yeah. So there are these lots of complicated circuits, many of them, which are going on in the brain which have evolved for reasons that we cannot intuitively imagine. Why is it parceled out? In fact, it gets even funnier. If you're damaged to left parietal cortex, so the hemineglect to the right. If you're damaged to the right parietal cortex, you do not have hemineglect to the other side. Yeah. So one part of space is special for in our brain. One side of space is special compared to the other side. And people think that is related to the language. Because language is processed in one side of the brain, which is the opposite of the side of the brain that's processing egocentric space. And what we are doing in VR constantly is actually creating two different kinds of spaces. That's what our brain is doing. We think, I'm here, and this is space. That's not true. It turns out there is one kind of space which is called egocentric space, which is that this is to my right, this is to my left. That's egocentric. It's centered on my body, invariably within my retina. There's another kind of space, which is I'm in this room 20 meters from the door and 3 meters from the wall. And what we are doing, whenever the stimuli are coming in, we are transforming those stimuli and turning egocentric information, because when I move from here to there, what is changing is egocentric information. And we are doing a very complicated transformation of egocentric maps into so-called allocentric maps, maps of where we are in space. And what we are trying in VR is to create that sense of where you are in allocentric space. And that's really hard. Yeah. Even mathematically, it's really hard. And there are many brain regions doing it. You, you brought up a very interesting point earlier when you said maybe VR can help make us smarter. That's right. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about how this panel feels about that. Um, you know, there's certainly been a lot of concerns about the health and safety aspects of, of VR, especially for the developing brain. Um, there's not a lot, we don't, as you pointed out, we don't know some things about uh, uh, the vestibular ocular reflex and other aspects. But there also has been some recent data. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the work from uh, Adam Guzeli's lab showing that we, um, that we can change some aspects of executive function using interactive environments. So, uh, because I worry about the coming um, tsunami of dementia, uh, that as our population and the world's population gets to be up into our 70s and 80s pretty soon, there's going to be 300 million people with um, Alzheimer's disease. That's going to be very expensive and could bankrupt uh, our, our, our economy if, unless we have something to do it. So I'm not saying we have the answers to this, but I'm curious what your impressions are. Do you think VR will have the powerful tools that can address issues of cognitive aging? And, and also, I, I guess I am also asking about the safety aspects of, of uh, VR, too. So maybe we'll go in the opposite way this time. All right. So since we have done a fair amount of research on that, I didn't mean to be disrespectful. <laughs> so it turns out that there are two distinct parts of the brain which talk to each other during, and, and those are the parts that get messed up in Alzheimer's disease. There's a part called the entorhinal cortex, 
That's where the amyloid beta and plaque start to form. And then you go downstream from there to the part I was talking about called hippocampus where I showed place cells. So if we figure out how these two parts are talking to each other and what goes wrong, we can figure out how to treat Alzheimer's at a microscopic level. Very recent discoveries have shown that the level of activity, how, how much neurons are active, itself determines how much A beta is produced, this bad protein that's involved in Alzheimer's. What we did, which I didn't talk about here, is that if you measured the activity in the entorhinal cortex where Alzheimer's begins and A beta is generated during sleep, specific parts of neurons in entorhinal cortex throughout the period of sleep behave as if they are remembering something. And that excessive activity generates A beta. We haven't shown that, but we hypothesize it happens. And during sleep, there are other kinds of cells that shrink, called glial cells. And they allow the A beta to be secreted out from neurons and removed from the so, body. So are you saying and that VR could have, an, uh, could be used to it drive? It could be used. In a in very interesting way, we could use VR to activate these groups of neurons in an interesting way to actually cure this at a microscopic level, that's not at the level of presence or something else. That's but fantastic something news. That's fantastic. It, this is still too early. I'm speculating yeah. wildly. Yeah. But well, that's, that's, I think that's it is why possible. we're here. That's, that's why right. We're here. This yeah. is the, the results that I told you, they are published, they are rock solid. But to solve that, we need to solve it before we say we can solve it. But we are working on it. Well, you've got about 20 years before. <laughs> but I'm sorry yeah. to jump the gun. Yeah, no. Please, go ahead. Well, the only thing I can say to that is it sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, I certainly can't speak to the Alzheimer's uh, side of things, although, I mean, I've read that research. It's super but, fascinating. But you could talk but about the, the pro-health aspects and uh, how we can improve our cognitive processing, perhaps, using... Well, I think the thing that particularly resonated that you said at the beginning around it was around can it improve our intelligence? And just, can it make us smarter, to, to use a more colloquial phrase? And I think that's a really interesting question, because at the end of the day, what does it mean to be smart? Yeah. You know, And part of that is, can we navigate our world effectively? Can we do the things that we have been you know, genetically selected to do over you know, thousands and thousands of years better? And you know, we live in a modern society upon which many layers of abstraction are laid over top of that. And so it's, it's in, often... In a, in a Cartesian way. Yes, yeah. right, indeed. So. <laughs> and I think it's often hard to kind of unpack that and see how that maps into you know, all of the stuff that's actually going on in your brain and, and the processes that that is, is driving. But things like artificial intelligence and augmented reality, I mean, you know, our ability to consume and process information is one of the most interesting things. We're at a very interesting time right now where the amount of information that is sent our way is huge. It's, you know, for many years it's been far more than we could realistically consume, but it's, it's growing dramatically every day. And our ability to be able to process that at a better rate and more efficiently, I think, is contingent on us being, quote unquote, smarter. And VR potentially offers that. VR offers an opportunity, not that we have unlocked it. I think we're still a ways from it. I mean, I think that's, this is the crux of the paradigm shift that is yet to happen, which is how we as humans interface with information. You know, we have very established metaphors right now. We have, we have books and even within computers, we maintain those metaphors and have files and all of these different things. But I think that our opportunity, despite what Hollywood may have tried to show us is uh, not necessarily, you know, Lawnmower Man and all, you know, mini Minority Report and all of these crazy things, but will be when we can shake off the availability bias of what we've always done and interact with information in a completely new way. That sounds great, and I'm, I'm really glad you didn't fall into my sneaky trap of the words smart and intelligence. It, it is a much more nuanced, complex issue, and I think you did a good way of describing the potential. So let me fall into the trap. Okay, please. <laughs> self for the, for the sake of so there's, alacrity. Th there's something pretty fascinating. So one more thing that the brain does is that while you're doing stuff, there are neurons responding to things out there and so on. But in addition to that, for some reasons, brain generates its own rhythms. Rhythms that you and I cannot hear. So for example, and these rhythms have something to do with smartness. That's where I'm going. So here is one fact. This part of hippocampus, part of the brain called hippocampus, if you are sitting still and listening, there is pretty much no rhythm. It's kind of active randomly. As soon as you start to walk, in 
simplest of the room, you just walk from here to there, the whole of hippocampus becomes rhythmic. And the rhythm is about eight times. And that's the rhythm, pretty much. As soon as you stop, the rhythm is gone. As soon as you start to fall asleep, you briefly get a rhythm that's slightly far faster than that as you are dozing off. So if I simply stuck an electrode on top of your skull, I can tell exactly when you are dozing off. As soon as you go to deep sleep, the rhythm becomes one times a second. And then when you start dreaming, that the same rhythm is back when you are dreaming. And if through pharma pharmacological manipulations or otherwise, you mess up that rhythm, leaving the rest of the brain intact, you cannot learn or remember anything. And there is a whole lot of literature, we can talk about it quite a lot, but what we found is that the same animal, when he's running in virtual reality with the same cues and happily with the same reward, the rhythm slows down. And I'm an optimist, and I know there are possibilities, and we know that it goes with 60% of the brain shutting down. So it's not going in the right direction. We also know that if the animals start to run faster, the rhythm gets faster. So we believe we can develop virtual reality which can be used to change the brain's rhythms in a way that rhythms are more suited for learning. And the link between learning and rhythm is long. So I won't take your time right now, but I'll be happy to tell people what is the relationship between brains on rhythm and learning. It has all got to do with timing between neurons. And I'll pause here. Okay. Well, actually, I, I have a list of more questions, but I think I'm going to pause for a moment. Uh, I, I know our audience has had questions since the first talk, and let's, let's give our audience a chance to come up and ask some questions. And, and if they don't ask questions, we'll come back to talking with each other. But uh, I'd like to hear what, what you folks would like to say. All right. Oh, Jesus. Um, so you spoke a lot about the impact, uh, the relationship between the real world neuronal firings and the virtual world. Um, but you had also spoken about restricting um, input so that it was more controllable. Do you think that there's some room for error in that area? That's a great question. So what I didn't show you is that we made a virtual world where we added another set of stimuli. We added sounds. In fact, we had a whole auditory landscape. There are frogs and crickets and waterfall and so on. And we tested these animals and how they can behave and so on. And it's a long story. I'll only tell you the title of our paper. The title of the paper is Multisensory Control of Multimodal Behavior colon, do the legs know what the tongue is doing? <laughs> serious, it's a serious paper, and the answer is no. Because it turns out that when we think that when we are behaving in VR or in real world, we think we are one person. But that's just not true. And it just so far was not possible to look at different aspects of it. What do I mean by so far it's not true? Let's say I went out of here and I started to walk. Maybe some part of my brain says, I really need to eat those giant 20 inches of pizza. And the other part says, nah, it's not a good idea. But maybe my feet will take me there anyway. Because I don't know, I ended up there. But more seriously, there are many, many parts of the brain that are generating this perception of what's going on there. And those parts are talking to each other in a very intricate way with these rhythms that I'm talking about. They lock to each other. And depending on what rhythm it is, different parts of the brain can lock in. And in VR, we can play with that. And we did some experiments where we can bring back place cells in VR under some conditions. But that's, again, a long story. But great question. May I ask a, may I ask a follow up? That's sure. Thing here really nice because you just reminded me of something that occurred to me while you were uh, describing the experimental setup for your rat experiment, which, by the way, I, I skimmed the paper while it was very interesting, but I hadn't really paid close attention to it. So 
uh, when, I, when I was listening to you describing it, I noticed that the experimental setup you have, the virtual reality setup that you did, was violating also some of the principles that I described in my presentation specifically uh, in that there was no stereoscopy, which for rats doesn't matter very much because they have very little binocular overlap, but also there's no motion parallax, which for rats is more important because they are animals with very little binocular overlap, so they rely more on motion parallax. So now, as it so happened, um, I have done sort of a private experiment and uh, so in our VR system in our cave, we normally have the full set of, uh, well, you saw the video, we have the full set of things running. And when everything is working together as it should, then the system, you have a very clear sense of where you are and how you can interact with things and you can use it to build three-dimensional structures. I can make molecules and all those things. But uh, because there are always uh, naysayers who tell me that stereo isn't important, and heterarchy isn't important, then I sometimes turn it off. And then it turns out the moment I turn these things off and everything else is still the same. Uh, I suddenly cannot use the system anymore. There's a fundamental drop in usability of the system because even though it, everything is still the same, just minus those two aspects, which are always underestimated, motion parallax and stereoscopy, it is suddenly becomes unusable. I feel lost. I do not know where I am. So do you think that there's a danger that your research actually shows that bad VR is bad for the brain? Good so question. we designed this VR intentionally with these features that we had in mind. So. What do I mean by that? So first thing is that the rats, when they want to look around, they move their heads. We move our eyes in our sockets. Rats don't move their eyes so much. They move their head. And when they move their head, they see exactly what is supposed to be there. Because it's, the screen is all around them. It's 360 degrees. Well, we can argue, but let me complete that. The second thing is that the rat's vernier acuity is about... 30 times less than humans. What that means is that when I stick my thumb out there, I can count where exactly the skin meets the nail. We can decipher things with an accuracy of 0.1 degrees. But rats can only see a thumb. They don't have that level of accuracy. So many of the ideas that we have developed in humans about the match or mismatch between two eyes and so on, or how much movement that we perceive, it doesn't apply to rats' brain. That's why stimuli we were using a lot of blue and green. They don't see red. So their eyes are different. Similarly, motion parallax, when the, as soon as they move, the scene is updated, but we made sure the ball was a little heavy. So their movements are not tremendously fast, naturally so. And when their movements are not tremendously fast, the lag between how much movement they make and how much the visual scene changes is accurate within 20%. So we can show test of this to say, for example, pure motion parallax of the visual scene itself. We showed they can detect it. In the video that I showed you, we showed they can do it. So we had a virtual platform, which is at this height, and the ground, which is at this height, and they had different texture. And we wanted to check, can the rat tell that he has reached the edge of this platform? For example, imagine the rat is at the, on this, this little arm of the chair. As soon as he moves his head, he can see that the edge of this arm of the chair is moving with respect to the ground. Can he avoid the edge? And we showed you in the pictures, that are videos that I showed you, within two trials, he can go and go away from the edge. Even though there's nothing to prevent him, there's nothing that he'll fall off, there is no tactile flu, clue. So it works actually pretty well. They can tell based on motion parallax where they are and use it in one trial. So would, this, would it be fair to say then that this is a good use of bad VR? I'm not even sure that that's bad VR actually. They are using motion parallax. In fact, in another paper we showed, we showed that you can see responses to individual neurons to these features. So we want to use VR intentionally so that it doesn't cause trouble for the rat. Mm -hmm. Given the optics and the features of his eyes and his brain, and the neural connections. So motion parallax is there. I just don't see why. Let's have a few more questions. OK. Yeah. Kind of two questions, a little bit unrelated to each other. Uh, the first one is uh, you mentioned that the 60% of the, the neurons shut down. Uh, do you think there's something that we can do to reactivate those? Or Absolutely. To, to increase presence? And maybe the second one is for fantastic contraption. I know you have that toolbox, but then you also have the gestures. Uh, how did you come up with putting those gestures in uh, for those more advanced users? 
So yes, we can activate more neurons, and we are working towards it. We need a lot more help than what we can. This is what we are bitten into is a lot more. But the answer lies in fixing those brain rhythms. It turns out that those brain rhythms, they are the ones which are playing a role in which neurons get wired up together. And depending on which neurons get wired up determines how many neurons are activated. So one result that I didn't show you is that if we change the behavioral contingencies of the animal, VR is not just stuff out there, it interacts with the subject. So if we make the subject's movements predictable in VR, more neurons get activated. But certainly we haven't reached the end, but we believe that within a few years, it should be possible to develop a VR that activates the brain fully. That should be possible. Next question. Or Kimberly, did you want to comment on that question? Uh, well, maybe I'll do part two, the fantastic contraption question. So the, the question, just to repeat it, was we have Neko, who is our cat toolbox in our world from which you can draw the items that you create your contraptions. But there's also, for those of you that have experimented a bit, who've tried the game, there are also gesture-based, so you can pull things from over a shoulder and you can experiment. And I encourage you, if you do try the game, to experiment because there's lots of things to discover. And so the question, if I have it correctly, was, where did that come from? How did we get from the toolbox to that? And why did we decide to have two persistent ways of interacting with or drawing tools? Uh, so the evolution of Neko as a cat in the world was, was interesting. I mean, it started out with the question of, we don't have a 2D. This was originally a 2D game that was made uh, in Flash in about 2007 uh, called Fantastic Contraption. And so it was an interesting challenge just to say, how do we take this into a 3D world into which you are immersed? and one of the immediate challenges was how do you, where do you get stuff from? You don't want to just pop up a menu. If you plaster something on your face that tracks with you, it makes a lot of people feel nauseated and it's not a very pleasant experience. And so we messed around with a few really diegetic options, things that felt a part of the world, from buckets to wheelbarrows to things that you could move around. And we just landed on a cat one day because cats are cool and it was fun to have it as a cat. So that's sort of how Neko evolved. But then as we got better, you know, you'd end up, you know, it's a, it's a full um, room scale game. So as you're moving about the world, you might end up over here. And eventually we got to a point where you could call Neko over, but you know, you kind of, you might wander around your space and for expediting that, being able to have things handy uh, was one justification for why we wanted to have an alternate system. But also it's just, it's faster in the end. So as you get better, you can pull things from behind your back and whatnot, and you just get this really cool flow to what it is that you're creating that felt really good. And it also provided an opportunity to discover interesting things for players as they got more advanced. They're kind of grabbing things like, oh, oh what are you? it's like the magician, right? What's this in your ear? Oh, well, it's a giant wood rod uh, and playing around with different things like that. So that was basically kind of, it evolved over time and it just felt really good and badass to be able to do that. Badass is a good reason. Very technical. Um, hi, I had a quick question about the, uh, the methodology and the experiment with the virtual reality with the, with the rat. I was just curious if, if perhaps the results were from the complete difference in locomotion because they were on top of a spinning ball instead of running around. So I was curious if he tried to test for that by making some kind of um, tiny robot wheelchair for the rats to move around on the table using just the, the spinning ball to see if that has the effect in the disparity. That's a brilliant question. So what we did is one version of it. So you're absolutely right that the movement of the rat has something to do with it. And when the rat runs in the real world, there are different sets of vestibular cues, such as linear acceleration or angular acceleration, which are kind of less. Even though in the virtual world, well, when he turns his head, he gets the full set of cues, which is in sync with the visual cues out there. So what we did is that in the same virtual world, instead of the reward appearing at random places, the reward appeared at only three places. Now what happens is that these locomotion cues, they start to be predictive of the reward. This is pretty high level, right? Not just VR or something. It's the same VR, he's in the same place, except that now he goes to a place where his brain says there will be reward. The reward expectation is matched. Instantly, the spatial maps came back. The 60% shutdown we were not able to control even with that, but at least the maps which were completely destroyed, from there the maps became as good as in the real world. 
So that goes in that direction. So that is possible. Um, thank you. I have a question for both Professor and the uh, Dr. Greenleaf. As, as you both mentioned, uh, VR could be a good uh, treatment solution for mental illness like uh, depression and things like that. So uh, I'm interested in what you mentioned, like the egocentric space. As we all know that depression comes first as the impaired uh, negative cognitive pattern, a scheme, actually. So uh, I would like to ask you to his opinion on whether you think that VR shall be a delicate or sublime uh, migration of the existing cognitive, like cognitive behavioral uh, therapy or uh, those 2D um, treatment into a uh, virtual space, or you're thinking that it might be another version of the treatment, and if so, how will you expect it be? Thank you. I, I'll, I think it will be both. I think we will see standard cognitive behavioral therapy for mood disorders uh, migrated to the virtual environments. But I think we can do more. Um, uh, I'll refer you to Michelle Kraske's lab at UCLA. UCLA, uh, she runs the Center on Anxiety and Depression. And she has standing up a VR lab. Uh, UCLA is putting together a grand challenge on depression, um, a, a big initiative to, to start with the campus but branch out from there uh, and do genetic sequencing and really address both um, the wellness aspect of mood disorders but also the clinical aspect. And uh, Michelle is going to be doing some work where we have people look through a virtual environment and do sort of a scavenger hunt for things that are positive. One of the problems that people have that are negative is that, uh, who are depressed is that they're always seeing and searching out for the negative things. So uh, the question is, will an exercise of asking people to search for the positive help change their outlook on the world? And it's an open question, but it's a new approach is my point. It's, it's just one example of, the tools that we have in a virtual environment that create very profound experiences, which activate uh, the cholinergic and the, uh, and the serotonergic and the dopaminergic and the reward systems, uh, I think are very powerful experiences which can help shape behavior. Yeah, um, just like according to your answer, I'm just wondering that like uh, before I think that, for example, like take CBT as example, it's basically an individ individual centric uh, treatment. Um, so do you think that there will be another version like the uh, therapy or treatment of the shared space I of see. people interactions? Uh, absolutely. I think one of the most powerful reward systems we have as humans is other humans. Uh, I think if we want to motivate someone and we want to change someone's behavior, if we want to leverage our mirror neuron systems, um, I think the most powerful reward we have is social interaction. So I, I, I expect that that we cannot solve the problems of depression unless we leverage those social systems. While she takes the microphone to the person, there's another interesting thing that we are, we are as well involved in the UCLA Grand Challenge program. So what we made an accidental discovery is that there is yet another rhythm. There are many rhythms in this part of the brain, hippocampus, which is also involved in depression. As soon as you start to run, and you run faster and faster, yet another rhythm appears in the brain, which is close to about 60 to 80 hertz. And the faster you run, the greater is the rhythm. Now, one thing you can tell anybody who is depressed is that as soon as you start to move, the sense of depression goes down. So we are working on that angle. It's also known from the brain's own biophysics rule that when that really fast rhythm appears, neurons link up together dynamically, not permanently, dynamically, which allows flexible behaviors called gamma rhythm for those who care. But yeah, there are interesting possibilities there. I think we have time for one more question. And, and then, of course, we'll stick around to ask, answer questions one on one. Okay, um, I recently became a father, and uh, the first words my child learned was are, are uh, mama, papa, and iPad. Um, one of the things is that we have to contend with is uh, how much to limit uh, technology, uh, the exposure of my, my uh, child to technology. Um, and we have to, uh, 
I guess it's still unknown uh, what the adverse effects of VR for children. Um, what age do you think that we should introduce VR to, to kids? Um, because again, they're still developing. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, my year and a half loves it, loves it too. If so I were to answer your question based yeah. on research and data, I would say we don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we don't know. And I, I do worry about parents who work three jobs and who are going to park their kids in front of a VR system because they don't have time to take them outside and play or read to them. So I do worry about this quite a bit. Um, in terms of the answer to your question, not only do we not know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows the answer, but I hope I'm wrong. Uh, do, what do you guys think? I mean, I think it's a super important question. I, I don't think I'm the best person here to address that. I don't particularly have a history in it, but it does remind me, and this is going back 20 years in university in one of my psychology classes where we were learning about the horrible things that they do to kittens. And the experiment was they had a litter of kittens that they'd raised in an environment that basically didn't have horizontal lines presented directly to them. So there were vertical lines, but no horizontal lines. And these kittens' brains did not develop in order to be able to differentiate edges. And so they would walk off edges unconsciously. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for what we expose our brains to when it's developing and how long-reaching those artifacts can be. I think it is safe to say, though, that we can work on coming up with the pro-social and the, and the brain enhancing, as you mentioned, things that can enhance our cognitive functions. So while we're trying to figure out what, what the danger zone is, we can be very conservative about our recommendations for use. But we can also start working on those things that will, that will be healthy for our brains. Yeah, I, I mean, those are great points. I mean. As you mentioned yourself, that these circuits between virgins and focal length, those circuits are developing early on. So maybe you want to add those points? Right. Well, I, I guess I can talk to it a little bit more from a technical perspective. And that is uh, one of the things is that VR, as it is created right now, just in terms of the hardware, doesn't really cater to not very young people, but to very small people. Because the adjustment ranges for eye distance and the size of the things are just not made to fit, let's say, a four-year-old. Really. You can kind of put it on them, but you're not really doing them a service. They're not going to get a good view, and they're not going to complain about it because it's kind of cool. Um, so we already talked about the, the developing accommodation virgins coupling, which is a very important skill. But again, the research indicates this gets set really, really early before anybody who is sane would consider exposing their toddler, in that case, to, uh, to VR, at least until now. Um, so then the, the other issue, and that uh, we haven't brought up yet, but it's something that we also, I guess, need to address, is the more uh, socialization aspect of it. Where if you, if you let someone, and you said, like, hey, let VR raise your child, that is probably not a good idea at any age, because uh, you have to learn uh, about how the real world behaves and consequences in the real world. Uh, and so if you put someone in VR where you can override certain consequences, where it doesn't matter if you fall down from a ledge, even though otherwise the impression and the visual of falling down a ledge is extremely natural, but you don't go splat when you reach the bottom, you're perfectly fine. So this, I have no idea if that would override certain built-in principles that we are learning also at a young age. I would, I'm totally speaking outside my area here, but that is something that we also must not forget. There's not just the neurological and uh, and technical uh, as aspects of it, um, but also the socialization and just general learning aspects. Um, so, I mean, there's always the anecdote that gets brought up that children, if you, that grew up on iPads, if you hand them an actual old school chemical photograph, they're doing this gesture, trying to zoom into the picture, which is, you know, it's kind of funny, there's no harm in that. Um, but there could potentially be harm, uh, again, if you train someone in VR, that it's okay to jump out of a window. Uh, I mean, this is almost, you know, a no-brainer to mention that, but I think it is still good that it, uh, that it is to be mentioned. Uh, just to give you one data point, my daughter is six and a half years old, uh, and uh, so far I have not put a VR headset on her. I, I think we could talk for a long time, and I hope we do, but my understanding is we need to shut down this panel discussion right about now. Um, thank you, I think, and thank you, the audience. I think it's fantastic that <laughs> we've had such a detailed and uh, amazing discussion. So I look forward to further discussions. And uh, Walter, thank you so much for coming here from the hospital. I mean, that's dedication right there. Can we get a hand for that, please?